Hey, 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 hey. It's me again. My name is Jocko van der Kooy. I'm the founder and co-CEO of Winning by Design. I'm telling you, it is a rainy, rainy afternoon here in California. And today I want to talk to you about non-sequential processes. I'm still in my keynote outfit. I just gave a couple of keynotes today. So I am just happy to be here with you and share this with you. Welcome, welcome. Well, what am I going to talk about today is non-sequential processes. And the reason why I'm so excited about this is because it is going to change everything. It has its influence on artificial intelligence, on automation, a lot of things going on in sales. Now, what I'm going to refer to is what you've seen here in the past. This is the sales playbook. And in this case, I use a five-stage sales playbook. There's plenty of more. Some of you have seven or eight stages and whatnot. Enterprise has more stages, high velocity has fewer, and so on and so forth. But essentially, we all go through these stages that I've depicted down here. Discovery, demo, assist, propose, and commit. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this sales process is an abstract view of the actions taking place. For example, in disco and demo, you're going to find this. What I'll try to say with that is in the discovery, you may do a demo. And in the demo, you may be doing a discovery. So looking at these stages, stages is an abstract view of the number of activities that take place. What we notice today is that the sales process no longer governs accurately what is re happening really during a B2B purchase. I'm going to describe that today and what I'm going to do that is in three specific steps. I'm going to show first what really happens in a real life you know, environment, one that I actually experienced myself why this happens, I'm going to explain why that occurred that way, so that when we define new sales processes, we can depict that in this new world that we're living in. Now, what you're going to see, a lot of this has to do with time and the, you know, how, how, how much faster things are going. First, what I'm going to take a look at is what really happens in the sales process. Now, I'm going to use another, the same five-stage sales process that I've shown to you before. But I'm going to see what in this case was a client who approached me and approached me and wanted to see a demo right away. They got that demo. Following the demo, they wanted to know how much the pricing was. And following the pricing, they wanted to learn more and bring in their team to do a discovery call. Once we did that, then the team went through a demo. And following the, the team doing a demo, we then started helping them with creating materials that the team needed in an effort. This may include a proposal, this may sometimes include the form of a proposal, but often it has to do with showing or demonstrating certain elements of what they need. Can you integrate X? Can you do Y? And so on and so forth. Following that, we went into the sales process, but in their case, we didn't go straight to the proposal. No, only at this point in time did we learn that they were going to submit an RFP and RF, or, or RFQ and bid it out against the competitor. Then we went back into the cycle, have to go through all the discovery again, and so on and so forth. What you'll see here is that this process, at which point in time do I put it in discovery mode? At that last step, in normal circumstances, I would push that back into discovery. But you know what? I've already been in stage one, two, three, and four. Sequential sales processes and the way how we integrate it in CRM, we do not like to push back a, to a previous stage. So we don't like to put something out of stage three and put it into stage two. What we see very often happen, there's only a one direction in the sales process. It is not two ways. It also has a number of sales stages that are less fluid. We can, for example, it's hard to codify uh, a go dark stage in here because it can occur at any point in time. It's not a sequential stage. Go dark can happen in stage one, two, three, four, and five. And there are specific actions that you need to take place. But in this abstraction of the activities based on stages, that doesn't seem to work. And consequently, its reflection in CRMs, therefore, doesn't seem to work. And consequently, the actions that we're being given as guidance to take doesn't seem to match what really needs to happen. Yes. And many of you go like, yes, that's exactly what happens in your real life. Now, what I'm going to take a look is what, why this happens. Where does this come from? Now we know what happens. Well, I can tell you why it happens and why it happens per today so much faster. In order to do that, I'm going to go back and take a look at what the form of communications is. 
Most of these stages I just described have to do with how we communicate with a customer. Did we send an email? Did, they, did we have a discovery call? Did we exchange email, uh, phone calls, whatnot, voicemails in the past, right? Now, what we see is that historically, we're looking at these three specific activities. The most urgent historically has been a phone call. When you get a phone call from your client, you pick up and you have instant contact. It's important and it's urgent. Your client is calling. Less important would be an email. Now, oh sorry, less urgent would be an email. It is still important. For example, it can have an attachment to it, such as a proposal or a signed contract. And so it's uh, very er uh, important. But your email may not recognize it as an urgent system. So obviously, now, nowadays with email automation systems, you may signal it when that email from that sender comes in. It's urgent. But historically, when you look at your inbox, there is none that looks more urgent than the other. It's just a whole bunch of emails. At the bottom, what historically has been the case is social engagement, forms of uh, working with, in this case, LinkedIn, for example. This is the reason why in the, historically we check email, uh, we check LinkedIn last. It's not something you, you started off with. Now that alone, as I, as I hear myself say it, I go like, wait, what? Because that has changed. What we see per today is that phone calls, for example, are no longer important or urgent. This is in part has to do with the amount of spam that we've received on it, but also in part has to do with we no longer value the form of voice-to-voice -voice communication the way we did historically. Many of you will now go like, oh my gosh, Jaco, I still love to talk to my client and I love, I'm, I'm not saying you should stop doing that. No, absolutely keep doing that. What I'm saying and what I'm talking about is how often does somebody call you a friend, a colleague, a boss, and you go like, dude, can you not just text me? Would that not be, yeah, you know, like just text me what you want to say to me. I don't need the whole conversation. This is an indication that a relationship with phone and the way how we think about communication is changing. The way we look at it is different. And for example, voicemails for any B2B, you know, experienced sales professional, voicemail was super important. You would be constantly checking your voicemail, so much so that in the days before there were cell phones, you would land, you would rush to a phone. Literally, they had these phone banks at the airport. You would you know, pop your coin in and you would listen to your voicemail what happened while you were gone. You see this every now and then in old movies, but that was what we all did. That's why those phone banks were so present. Every now and then at an old airport, you still see them and you go like, yeah, and people are now standing there with their cell phone in that, not picking up the phone that's there, just with the cell phone to enjoy the acoustic behavior of that, of that phone booth. But what we noticed is, is that this also is now applying to email. We see less and less that we're taking a look at email simply because there's so much spam. It's so hard to understand and to see the urgency of that message. What we see on the other hand happen is that when we go to LinkedIn and what we see more and more often is that people spend a lot more time going to LinkedIn and checking their LinkedIn messages. Now what we see is early on in the relationship, more communications happen through LinkedIn, further down a relationship, once we know that person, once we know their phone number, once we can you know, put them inside our phone as a VIP so it pops straight up, then we switch back to phone. But early on in the communication, you're going to find that there's some communication taking place via social, among others, LinkedIn. Not only LinkedIn, but we see also this takes place, for example, for those of you who communicate more in the B2C space with clients or in, in, you know, in higher vo velocity volume kind deals, you see that Facebook plays a role. For those of you who are dealing more with, you know, like a VC and PE firms, you see that Twitter plays a role. For those of you all across the world, we see in Latin America, great use of Instagram, for example. What we see here is that that middle category of urgent and, you know, like not urgent, but sorry, not urgent but important, that one is going to go away. We just see that we don't think in these three categories. We think more and more like, am I going to social or am I going more to traditional check email and voicemail? What we see that that is no longer just based on urgency. What we noticed is that the relationship that we are having with those social platform is based on contextual relevance. If somebody sends me a LinkedIn in-mail, I know which company they work from, who they are, how much mutual connections we have, and so on and so forth. When I get a cold call, I have no ID. I see a phone number that I don't recognize. When a LinkedIn message comes in, it has context. When a cold phone call comes in, then it doesn't have any context. This lack of context makes us determine that nowadays an in-mail message is deemed more valuable than a cold inbound 
email. Now, mind you, that if an email comes from an existing client that you have recognized as a VIP, who then introduces you to a new client, obviously that is, again, an email with context and therefore super important. What we notice is that simply phone and email often lack that context and therefore are more irrelevant. If we see today, we see a number of other platforms starting to provide us with that contextual relevance. We see, for example, that YouTube gives us an indication. You see the historic videos that that person has published and whatnot. We also see that phone call and the behavior of phone and email starts to now translate into other apps, whether a phone call now can be held in a WhatsApp, which at the same time you can send a text message and now you can see both taking place. Zoom calls, uh, WebEx calls, Skype calls, all those things are starting to transfer from that similar, like, hey, I just get a phone call on my direct line versus a more digital call that provides more context. More recently, we start to see that Slack messages with existing customer, which applies very much so to customer success, that building and exchanging emails and exchanging Slack messages, that Slack messages starts to favor when we integrate with a client. Again, this applies to post sales, where we now know who the client is and where we are having a mutual Slack group together where we work with the client. We are taking that away from email. Why? Again, contextual relevance. What we see if I now bring this back and I bring this back to that earlier sales process that I showed you, I can now tell you how this applied and why this made our sequential sales process so non-sequential. In this case, the client who approached me had already set, seen a video. They had already experienced that demo experience by watching a YouTube video. Now, when they watched that YouTube video and the reason why they watched that, that gave them a great experience. Next, what we started to see is that based on that, they are looking at an in-mail experience. They approach to me via in-mail. And so the moment in time they come to me after they watch the, 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 the YouTube video, then they went to in-mail. And in this case, the contact, her and I were chatting you know, at 9, 10 o'clock at night. I was on the couch and she was reaching out to me and we we're chatting back and forth. It was high velocity quick question and ask, you know, you, you know, in, as you know, very well know when you're chatting like that, you don't put a lot of, you know, you don't write the whole stories. It's a quick Q and A potential link here, attachment there and so on and so forth. This all happened in InMail, straight up questions, straight up answers. We went very fast, but then suddenly we decided at the end of our chat, Hey, let's get our teams involved. And we exchanged email messages, what our email address was on LinkedIn. Now, what we did, the moment in time we switched to, to, to email, everything slowed down. No longer were we real-time chatting. We now had to wait for others to chime in on our email in order to schedule, in this case, a Zoom session that we had. Following that, we did a discovery call. And in the discovery call, every time we, we did a discovery call, not only did we record that discovery call, not only did we record the demo, Post the call, I personally created five or 10 minute summaries of those, of those sessions because I knew that nobody would watch those one hour you know, in, in its entirety. So post the call, I created five minute asynchronous videos that summarize the entire relationship, the entire topic of discovery that we covered. This was highly valuable to them. As we now went to the proposal stage where we started to exchange a proposal and draft it, what I noticed is that multiple people were getting involved in this. The broader teams were getting involved. What had happened is these asynchronous videos that I had created were seen by a lot more people. And I'm not talking about like, you know, B2C kind of like millions of views or anything. I've noticed that there were views, 10, 20 views on that asset, that asynchronous video. A broader team was watching that. What you'll see is that as a result, as new people were added and went back to discovery demo stage and so on, no longer did I need to step, separate a call, run the full process with them. Okay, here's what we do and so on and so forth. They simply got access to these asynchronous videos and were immediately in, engaged. Not that I did not want to talk to them. Of course, I do want to talk to them. But the level of pre-education that occurred made them approach us in a way more capable mode. They already know what they were doing. This, this approach and the reason why you see that this sales process and why people are approaching us 
is because the way we communicate and the tools we are using make it possible. It is the tools that enable this process and that allows the buyer to buy at a different pace. You may have heard me before when I said it's like in B2B enterprise sales cycles, it is often us, the sellers, who are slowing things down because we are not helping them with the tools. We are not providing them a YouTube video. We are not recording the asynchronous video. And as a result, we are slowing the buyer down. These tools today make it possible. What you are going to see is that the buyer actually use a very different process and that our sales process, as sales-centric as it is, does not address the buyer's need. That I'm going to discuss next. Now what you'll see down here is how we think a sales process works. This is that same playbook and many of you have a sales playbook somewhere along, somewhere what we call a CRM sheet by stage. Here's the actions you need to take. Here's the check boxes you need to stage and the CRM matches that closely. You go through it step by step. What we see is that we think this is how the buyer buys, but as I, as I just demonstrated to you based on the tools, this no longer is a correct reflection of it. What you'll see is that all these lines down here is really what happens. We're moving back and forth, not a call, not a call here, email there, and so on and so forth. And as a result, we can never on an abstract level correctly reflect that in our CRM where we are currently at. Combine that with the behavior of us as sales professionals that we not necessarily want to go stage. Oh, we're now in stage four. Tomorrow, let me move it back to stage two. You know what? Uh, we're back to stage three the next day. Uh, next week, we're moving back to stage two. We don't do that because, you know, like in generally, we are trained that our bosses will reflect badly upon that. What's happening? Why are you moving to these stages? You should, you know, you're, you're supposed to be in stage two, check all the boxes, move to stage three. But our buyers don't think like that. That's not how they are buying. And as we are pushing them into that process, this process, this uh, strict process, then you see that it doesn't, the actions are no longer reflective. The actions we are recommending are no longer reflective of what the buyer wants. It causes issues. Now, this is what it is per today. This is how we notice. What I'm proud to present you next is what really happens, but is not how our CRM systems can do it per today. It is not how I want you to go back. I just simply want to share with you a new way, give to you and point to you what the future will look like. And as the future will look like, how we can use mathematical models and what we can do with that, okay? So what I'm presenting next is 99% of all companies out there don't have any of this in place yet. And I'm still looking for the one that does. What we see here is that these processes essentially create the square peg in a round hole. We want to push the customers into this process, but the customers are not buying along this process. As a result, forecasting, the percentage that is associated with each stage, become fairly meaningless. What we see today is that often happens, and as a result, our forecasting still, particularly as it comes into the advanced stages, depends very much on interviewing the sales rep and getting a real lay of the land. Talking to the sales rep gets a more accurate feel rather than the stage perspective. And again, that abstract level of the stages no longer is a correct reflection. What you see, what is a more accurate reflection, if you don't think of it as stages, but if you think of it as activities, these activities need to take place. Some of these activities can take place in a single call. You can do a disco in the same call that you do a demo. But it is these five activities that take place. And these five activities have a relationship for, with, a, with, with each other. We call that graph. For those of you who are interested in learning more about this, just Googling graph theory will bring up a lot more depth. You start to see and you start to recognize the patterns that evolve. We are not the first industry that experiences this. I personally learned about this in my telecommunications class as I noticed how IP packets you know, make, move over IP networks. They move like in, in these theory graph networks, they move from node to node. They can go to multiple nodes at the same time. We see the same thing happening down here. In this process, what you see depicted here, a client can come in in any one of these five actions. It can move to one of the other actions. Obviously, there's a relationship. There probably is a relationship that Disco Demo is a close relationship, that a commitment probably follows a proposal, and so on and so forth. These are more active relationship between these. What I'm going to do is to show you the depth of where this is headed if I simply go to three simple actions 
that take place in a high velocity environment. Now, I'm going to describe these actions as disco demo commit. Now, where I know many of you listeners will trip up is to think that disco is a separate meeting from demo. Oh my gosh, do I need to first do a 30 minute disco and then next week I do a 30 minute demo? Many enterprise sales reps have historically been trained to not give a demo until you understand the customer's requirements. As a result, you'll see that many of us have been conditioned in B2B sales to think of a customer comes in, first do discovery, then demonstrate, then gain the commitment, even in high velocity. Discovery done by the SDR, hand it off to, for example, an account executive. They do some discovery again, and if, the, if they have been incorrectly trained, they're going to get a demo a week later. You are once again delaying the entire sales process. You're spreading things out. We don't want to think these as independent meetings. You can see them as the same meeting. What we see here, disco demo commit, is a very common way that we're looking at it. But again, I want you to look at them as actions that can take place in the same meeting. For all I know, the disco demo commit takes place in the 30 minute meeting for a super high velocity sale. However, if I take a look at what really is happening and what you are starting to experience, what is really the activity taking place, what you'll see, what more accurately reflect this, is that you do a disco, then you do a demo that may be taken in the first place, and you know what? Then we need to reschedule another meeting, step number three, because you know what? We're going to have to do a disco demo all over again with a new group of people, an additional person. And then finally, we get to the commit. So we are moving between these actions back and forth. Again, if I would correctly reflect this in a sequential sales process, I would move that. I would move to stage one, stage two, stage one, stage two, stage one, stage two, stage four. You know, it would be incorrect. However, as I said, the, the stage is no longer reflected. The activities, however, will continue to reflect it accurately. Now look what I'm going to do. And I'm going to stretch your imagination here, okay? I'm going to like, like, like tweet and twiddle. I'm going to go like, watch what I'm doing next. Why should we start with a discovery? Who said that? Who came up and said like, oh my gosh, you got to start with the discovery. What if, follow me here, stay in tune with me. What if we start with a demo? So what I'm going to do now is I'm not starting with discovery. You see the number one box. I'm coming in and I'm giving a demo first. Wait, what? What are we doing? Well, during a demo, you can discover too. But Jaco, you always say, don't sell, help the customer to buy. Hang with me, okay? The customer is now going to come in on a demo. They realize that's what they want. Then we go into discovery. And in the context of the demo, we're going to discover what exactly it is that they want. Then we're going to go back to the demo to now put what they actually wanted and what we discussed during the discovery. And then we're putting that in context of their needs in the demo. Following the demo, the client then says, yes, that's what I want to buy. And we can make a proposal and achieve the commitment. So now we enter the demo. I'm going to stretch it even further. Who said that the demo needed to take place real time? Who said that the demo needed to be on a screen shared call? Why can that demo not be a YouTube video? Wait, now what you start to see is once I start stretching that imagination and say like, look, the client already started this non-sequential sales process by watching a YouTube video. Not only that, they then visited your LinkedIn profile where they did their own discovery, for example, through a research paper. For those of you who have visited my LinkedIn profile, you see we put research papers up there. And often our clients come to us, have seen the video, have seen a video like this, go to the LinkedIn profile, click on the research. And so by the time that they are going to click on that research, they are themselves doing their own discovery. It is the client who does this. And the reason is, is they can do this on a Saturday night they see, watch the video at 9 o'clock p.m. and at 10 o'clock, you know, they're, watching, they're reading the research paper. They do it at their speed. We don't have to set up meetings. Things start to accelerate, which is very valuable in a high-velocity sale. What you now see is that those first two steps, the client was still taking them. I am simply facilitated these actions in an asynchronous way. 
what the client now comes into, they come into the demo call, or in, you know, in this case, as you see step one, they've done the discovery, now they approach us, and at that demo, we're going to do an educated disco demo. We're demonstrating something, and during the demo, we're asking questions. The client is surrendering insight as we help them with it, and we're truly helping them, allowing us to make a faster decision. What you see and what I'm trying to make you, you know, like make, make palatable, palatable, how do you call that? Make it tasteable, like here, is the fol following. If I compare these three different things, scenario A, where I lead with an in-person discovery call, then I, in that I'm doing a demo, then I do another discovery call and then, you know, we make a proposal and we get a commitment. Or I go into scenario B, where I lead with a demo, then do a disco, then do a demo and then lead to a commit. Or I go into uh, um, scenario C, where I lead with education online, provide the YouTube video, you know, provide research material. In this case, I depict that through the LinkedIn uh, uh, icon, but it could be in other ways too. And then they come to me and then I do a demo commit. What we can now determine is that based on any of these scenarios, what is the different win rate? What is the set length of the sales cycle? And what is the anticipated client at acquisition cost? Although it is not 100%, we do not have the ability to measure it, we are currently anticipating, in this case, that scenario C will have a higher win rate, will have a shorter sales cycle, and as a result, will have a lower client acquisition cost. This shows us that as we move to non-sequential sales processes, as I depict down here, and we start complicating that with additional stages, that it is a correct reflection of what is happening. That it is not the sales process which is historically depicted as linear or sequential, but that it is this graph theory based, node network based, non sequential process. Dang, what a number of like, wow, what a words were there. Woo! Okay, all those words are more reflective of the buying behavior. This particular graph that you see down here is way more reflective. I don't want to take you there just right now. I just want to let you know in the future, we can calculate the conversion rate of a future meeting of a future block based on the conversion rate of the, the past and the current block. That means that we can calculate on the path what is the most likely path to succeed and start making the correct suggestions, the correct advice that you need to take place, that need to take place. This gives you an idea that non-sequential sales processes start to more accurately reflect the buying behavior. And as a result, we can help the clients with that. That depicts step one to three that I wanted to share with you on this rainy afternoon. What really happens is that our standard linear slash sequential sales processes no longer are reflecting the buyer's way of buying that the way we communicate is exasperating that particular non-linear relationship, non-sequential relationship, and that non-sequential sales processes are coming in at the rapid stage as we respond to the way. And the key here is to sell faster or to help the customer rather buy faster. Well, with that, I certainly hope that you enjoy all these blabbings that I'm giving. I love sharing these insights with you. I hope that it helps you. And with that said, I'm going to wish you a happy, happy day. Please, when you look me up, click on our YouTube, subscribe. You know, every two weeks we launch a video like this. Not too many. I don't like too many. But every, but every two weeks we launch a video like this. Um, what else do I have going on? Click. Oh, I need to know. Can you give me a thumbs up if you like this? Because for me, it's really important to know if this is the right kind of format, if you like this or not. Follow me on LinkedIn and so on and so forth. With that said, I'm going to wish you all a happy, happy rainy afternoon. And I hope that we're going to get some sunshine soon, okay? And a little slice of heaven. See you later. Bye-bye.